Chapter 81 Hidden Technique You are listening at NovelFull.audio Xavier was grateful for the advent of both men because they had saved him from the arduous task of having to explain himself on how he was able to use such a great power without having to actually rely on magic. At this point, just about every single one was hooked on the prospect of Xavier's mysterious power. True entertainment was scarce in those days, so the mere thought of bearing witness to such an exotic display of power filled both the student, the civil servant, the governor and the top-rated senior mage with an anxiety that was more primitive than logical. Up until this moment, they had all led pretty boring lives. The governor most especially was itching for the stranger's display. After months on end of having to comb through stacks and stacks of incredibly boring paperwork, the governor was ripe for any kind of entertainment. He craved it more than anyone present in that group. Erlene also had her reasons, though they were basically ostentatious and borderline selfish, to her, they were valid reasons. The white-bearded old man, the cunning silver knight, and of course, the little boy kept their entire attention fixated on Xavier. Xavier was the star of show, and he knew that he had the power to do whatever he wanted. No one was more nervous than Adelia. Even though she had seen Xavier's dexterity with killing machines, she was still very much in the dark as to just as Xavier intended to go about destroying an entire bucket of water without actually touching it. Adelia had complete faith in Xavier, but even she who had seen his work up close, was still looking forward to seeing his performance. With about six different pairs of eyes fixated on him at once, Xavier could almost taste the varying degrees of doubt and hope in their eyes. It was like walking through a valley under the watchful gaze of an extraterrestrial entity. The atmosphere was thick and heavy with tension. Taking full advantage of the attention that was now riveted on him, Xavier assumed the air of one who had something important to announce. He cleared his throat dramatically. Thoroughly enjoying the scene, he began ambiguously, fine, I will show you this hidden technique. But first. He shot his left hand up in the air, I must warn you. This is a very peculiar technique that has been passed down in my family, from the custodians of our culture to generations unborn. He paused for a minute before continuing his gripping narration. BVEC, so, I implore you all, please keep this as a well-guarded secret. Outside of my family, you all are the first generation of humans to witness this. Xavier was beginning to understand that he had to play hardball with these people in order to get what he wanted. It wasn't completely their fault, their lives were so simple and devoid of any kind of drama, hence they were the perfect mark for such hogwash. This was just the type of thing that they would just gobble up. Xavier wasn't the type that enjoyed deceiving them, but it was because he was exhausted of the whole repetitive cycle of having to explain to people why he was so powerful without having any kind of magic whatsoever. It was a really tiresome pattern, and for the first time, he had taken a slightly different approach to the handling of this matter. He just couldn't them that the answer was Lady Science, that answer was sure to open doors for even more questions and probing. Xavier's ace in the hole was science. Science and a little bit of applied technology were the very keys that Xavier was planning on using to baffle the small crowd who looked up to him like a bunch of spectators at a circus show. Fascination, delightful amusement, with a subtle hint of doubt which launched incessant attacks on the growing seeds of hope. Because his plan was simply to use some basic scientific techniques to create an illusion of a powerful magical spell, Xavier had to make it flashy because to this crowd, magic wasn't exactly a big deal. Indeed it was more common than the oxygen which they breathed in day and night. But on the other hand, in this ice sky, advanced science was scarcer than pretty gemstones. In this case, the scientific backwardness of this ice sky proved to be very rewarding for Xavier. So, even if he performed the most basic form of scientific experiments, he could easily pass it off as a magic trick. This deception was going to be paramount for Xavier. This way, he didn't have to indulge the endless questions. Amongst the members of the group, asides from Adelia, Dale was the only one who had tangoed with Xavier, both physically and psychologically, and on some level, spiritually. So, consequently, he never took for granted anything that came out of Xavier's mouth. 
He expected a kind of fall out from such a demonstration, so he prudently called out to Xavier to pause, hold on a minute Xavier, he cried. Not expecting this, Xavier looked at Dale questioning, wondering what exactly the Silver Knight was up to. But Xavier's reaction was pretty mild compared to the others. Almost immediately, like a pack of wolves whose kill had been interrupted, every pair of eyes, including the governor's, turned angrily to face Dale in a coordinated wrathful rage. Surprised by the reaction, Dale immediately moved to defend himself. I'm not saying that you shouldn't proceed. But governor, I believe safety should be paramount at this moment. Are you in any way insinuating that there could be a security problem? Speak up. Au contraire. I am simply pointing out the fact that we are in uncharted waters here. Both Dale and the governor were at the vanguard of the small gathering. So, the dialogue between them wasn't publicly heard. Dale, the governor snapped. You'd better get to your point fast. You're walking on thin ice here. Forgive me governor. Permit me to carry out one simple task. Obviously irritated, the governor waved him off and sent him away to accomplish that which he intended to do. In truth, Dale's plan was to use the servants to seal off the mansion and estate. He stealthily gave orders to the servants to not allow anyone into the estate at this hour. Of course, the order was received with the utmost priority. Servants carefully secured the grounds on Dale's order, making sure not to spook anyone or signify that they were on guard. All the servants left, except Adelia. So, having purged all the external elements and unnecessary personnel from the location, only Adelia, Erling, her younger brother, the senior mage Laddie, Silver Knight Dale, and Governor Quaid remained in the courtyard. Seeing just how prudent Dale's decision to remove all the unnecessary elements was, Governor Quaid moved to take the glory. My dear boy, he was addressing Xavier now. You've made it clear that this is to be a secret, so, I've taken it upon myself to get rid of every loose end that could be a potential saboteur in the future. Your family's secrets are safe. To further enhance the illusion he was actively creating, Xavier took another moment in silence. When he finally spoke up, he had the semblance of one who was in a trance. His body movements looked automated, he had a faraway look in his eye and a solemn look on his face. His voice barely above a whisper, he called on the first person who had a role to play. Master Laddie. Kindly get me a hollowed out log of wood that resembles a pillar. It should be at least several dozen feet long. Laddie's logical mind began to turn itself inside out as it struggled to figure out Xavier's plan. But his guess was as good as the others who came up short as well. So, Laddie proceeded to obtain the required object. The senior mage stretched out his hand and with the impressively powerful magic of a top mage, he summoned a sweet piece of sturdy long bamboo. There were no gasps or cries of surprise in the background. They were all citizens of Victoria City, a city where magic was commonplace. A basic summoning of this nature was nothing to them. They had all seen worse, and better. The bamboo stick wasn't yet refined to Xavier's particular specs. So, the old man used magic once again to customize the stick into the very picture of what Xavier had requested for. With the whole group watching closely, Laddie handed the bamboo stick over to Xavier and waited for further instructions. Everyone looked hard at the ordinary looking bamboo stick, trying their best to dream up one of the several ways that Xavier could use it in this situation. Xavier gingerly examined it thoroughly till he was satisfied with the senior mage's work. Finally, he moved forward with his plan. Chapter 82 Need Your Help You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. With all eyes on him watching his every move like a hawk, Xavier spoke addressed Laddie again in the same auspicious tone as before, now carefully insert the hollowed out bamboo pole into the bucket, and make sure the two adjoining points are closed. Laddie was still baffled, there was still not a single trace of mana, and yet, Xavier was confidently putting things in place for his mysterious family power to be displayed. Moved by nothing but sheer curiosity, Laddie edged his way towards the bucket and inserted the stick into it. 
the adjoining part between the two sides, he kept closed. The atmosphere was even denser than before. The fact that this was supposed to be a secret further enhanced the already ominous atmosphere, giving off a general aura of the forbidden. It was both intoxicating and a little frightening. Despite their individual reservations, every single of them was thrilled to be a part of something as wholesome as this. By all appearances, it was a simple gathering with mostly ordinary people. But Xavier's showmanship had given it a different element. It was almost like he had given them a unique window into a strange world. They gawked at his every move with the laser dot sharp like focus of an eagle. Indeed, it felt more like a ritual in a secret society than a mere display of power. Laddie was Xavier's instrument of the hour. Each time Xavier asked him to do something, the old man could feel the overbearing weight of all the eyes fixated on him, anxiously watching his every move, waiting like a brood of vipers sitting in the darkness as they waited for their prey. Laddie wasn't a youth anymore. In fact, he dwarfed everyone when it came to age, experience and understanding. But somehow, in that moment, he felt so little. Almost as if he was back in the school of the mages, seated like an ordinary schoolboy in the class and surrounded by his mates. Could this be some sort of psychic manipulation, the old man wondered to himself. But that would be impossible. There isn't any evidence of mana being used at this point, he thought. So then, what exactly is this? With advanced years came experience. And from this experience, knowledge and deep understanding. And from this wealth of knowledge, a certain confidence is born. A confidence that is stemmed from the fact that no matter what may arise, the wealth of knowledge and experience stored up could handle it. For an entity like Laddie who was a top mage, his mental knowledge bank was as large as a cathedral. In his quest for power, and in his desire to advance further as a powerful mage, Laddie had digested a decent amount of knowledge. As he advanced in years, he began to discover that there were very few things that could shock him anymore. This was the basis of his confidence. And yet, since he met this strange young man, all he had ever been was shocked, surprised and mesmerized. No matter how much the old man tried, he just couldn't seem to fully grasp the mental and spiritual state of the stranger, the same stranger who had killed the chief orc all on his own. A task that no one ever thought was possible, talk less of daring to try it out. Even now, Laddie didn't know exactly what Xavier planned for the next moment. But all the same, he was more than willing to find out. So, with about a million different linking thoughts rushing through his mind at that point, Laddie suppressed his own gnawing desire to know, and decided to act out Xavier's instructions. After all, he had nothing to lose by indulging the young man. If he was a fraud, Sooner or later he would be exposed. However, with every passing moment, the likelihood of that being the outcome diminished more and more. Despite the traffic in his own mind, Laddie found himself moving to do what Xavier had asked. The old man lifted up his arms that were hidden in the sleeves of his long robe, and pointed two of his forefingers, on each hand, at the lid of the bucket. Like an industrial high-energy laser beam drilling a hole into an object, an invisible force drilled a neat hole through the bucket lid. Having created the ideal opening using very efficient magic, Caden inserted the bamboo pole into the bucket through this small hole. Then, he used sealing magic to close up the connection, leaving only a pathway for water to enter the top part of the bamboo pole. Now the bamboo pole was several feet long. So, it was practically impossible for Xavier to reach the top. So, his quick searched the surrounding area for anything he could use to boost his height. His darting eyes soon fell on a table sitting idly in the corner. Without wasting any further time, Xavier dashed towards it and dragged it towards the bucket. Next, hopped on it and looked towards the top of the bamboo pole. Unfortunately, the altitude the table gave him wasn't enough, not nearly. He still had a very good distance to cover. Faced with this obstacle, Xavier looked down at the group. Their eyes stared longingly at him, reflecting their inner anxiety. Xavier called on Adelia who was right next to him. Dot, Adelia, could you come up here please? 
I need your help. Though Dale didn't voice it out, he thought that Xavier was indeed a really strange fellow. The Silver Knight couldn't understand why anyone would add, please, to a mere servant when requesting for their services. This further strengthened the theory that Xavier must really be from a place that was so remote, and so far away from civilization. Dale kept his reservation to himself and continued to watch Xavier closely. The Silver Knight wasn't completely aware of what Xavier and Adelia had together. He didn't know, and he could not understand it, because he wasn't there. When Xavier saved Adelia from being devoured by a band of aroused orcs, an invisible cord of friendship bound both of them and sealed their fates. So, in their case, it wasn't just the typical hero-damsel dynamic, they were true friends who saw something decent in each other. Of course, someone as shallow as the Silver Knight wouldn't understand. So, when Adelia heard Xavier's call, she promptly responded. As she climbed the table, she was filled with a kind of pride that came from being chosen by Xavier to help with such a delicate matter. When Xavier called on her to help him, Adelia wasn't sure what he needed her to do. Once again, Xavier lived up to his reputation as the one who always shocked people. Without even saying a word or giving her a heads up, Xavier suddenly picked Adelia up and mounted her on his shoulders as if she was a baby. Adelia was taken unawares and blushed red when she felt Xavier's strong arms on her hips. But when he jerked her up and placed her on his shoulders in one full swing, Adelia screamed in shock. She only stopped screaming when Xavier balanced her well on his broad shoulders. Adelia was embarrassed to helplessness. As she sat on Xavier's shoulders, overlooking the astonished faces of the others below, she recoiled inwardly with a sense of shyness. She wished Xavier had told her ahead of time that this was what he wanted from her. No doubt, she wouldn't have said no to him, but at least she would have been prepared. Adelia was still trembling all over and shaking like a fish that had been dragged out of water and placed on dry land. Xavier's comforting voice came to her, assuaging her fears, relax okay. I've got you. It was going to take a whole lot than comforting words to get her to calm down. It took a while before Adelia settled down. Xavier's firm and reassuring hands on her torso did the trick. Sensing that she was a bit more relaxed now, Xavier let go of her torso and bent to pick up a ladle of water. Not wanting to fall, Adelia gripped Xavier's hair so tightly that veins popped out on his head. He then handed her the ladle saying, take this ladle and pour down the water into the bamboo pole. Make sure every drop of water goes down the lid into open part. Adelia's head had been tilted downwards throughout the period she had been mounted on Xavier's back. So she hadn't even noticed that she was way above the bamboo pole. So, she wouldn't have any issues whatsoever with the task Xavier had assigned to her. Instinctively, she looked towards the direction of her boss who was the governor. The governor's hawk-dot-like eyes had been following her every movement. So, when their eyes met, he gave the servant girl his go-ahead by nodding his head in approval. Chapter 83 Blast Out You Are Listening at Novel Full Audio. That was all she needed. After receiving the governor's endorsing signal, Adelia carefully lifted the ladle to the tip of the pole. She could feel everyone staring at her, so after she took a deep breath, she slowly poured down the water down the throat of the bamboo pole. A thick mist of anxiety saturated the open space. Every single one watched with eager eyes and nervous minds as the water trickled down the ladle into the pole. There was no telling what would happen next. Their minds struggled to keep up with the plot, eagerly anticipating what would happen next. In accordance with the increasing volume of water, the pitch rose as well, signaling that the water inside the bamboo pole was about to overflow. Adelia's sensitive ears picked this up since she was the closest person to the experiment. She didn't know what she was supposed to do at this point, so, she simply kept pouring. Unknown to the poor clueless girl, she was about to receive the shock of her life. With the time of the plot twist drawing close, the doors of expectation began to open wider and wider in the minds of everyone present. 
The entire room seemed to hold their breath as they waited for even the slightest sign of what was to come. They were not disappointed. B.O. of what they were waiting for finally came. There was no sign, there was not even the tiniest indication of what was to come. In spite of the fact that they were all aware that something superficial and magnanimous was about to happen, they were still taken completely unawares. With the chilling suddenness of a natural disaster, and with the cold stealth of nature's slickest predators, the result of Xavier's display crept up on them. Just as the water level in the bamboo pole was about to overflow, the bucket burst open. Shattered in several irreparable pieces, the way and manner with which the bucket had burst open had the likeness of a detonating atomic bomb, but on a much smaller scale. Being the closet one to the carnage, and being the one whose heart was the most fixated on Xavier's display of power, Adelia very nearly had a heart attack when the bucket exploded suddenly, and without warning. She remembered the way Xavier had launched similar explosions in their battle against the orcs. This PTSD from that sight further augmented her fear. So, without even knowing it, her mouth opened, and from the depth of her soul, she screamed out in fright. She almost doubled over in panic if not for Xavier's sturdy hands gripping her tightly on her waist. The others weren't left out. They all had their share of the cake that was shock. Everyone felt the same equal amount of terror and surprise, but outwardly, it seemed like some were more shocked than others. Dale and Laddie who had been the chief doubters, found their hopes of Xavier's failure dashed to pieces along with the obliterated, sturdy bucket. Plastered on their faces was the type of look of surprise that one only got to see once in a lifetime. They were well and truly flabbergasted. There was no hiding it. Within them, the insides churned as a result of the internal conflict raging within them as they were forced to admit that they had been wrong. For cocky, self-confident men like them who had never known doubt, defeat or loss, all their adult lives, this was a teachable moment for them. It was a lesson that life truly had more to offer, and most times, it almost always comes through mediums that one would never suspect. The rest of them including the governor and his daughter drank in the scene with a mixture of shock, and a giddiness that was born from having witnessed a thrilling scene. As the novelty of the surprise slowly dissipated, the hungry look in their eyes suggested that they wanted more. They thought that what Adelia had just done was a mere teaser of what was to come. They thought that Xavier would step in at the last moment with some powerful display of power and dazzle them all with the finishing move. While the others dealt with their individual reactions, Laddie poured over every single detail of Xavier's performance, from the beginning, up till the very moment when it had manifested. At the end of the old man's analysis, he was still shocked to the bones. Magic was his specialty, and yet, there hadn't been a single shred of magic involved in the process. If there was, he would have detected it. No matter how the old man tried to look at it, he found himself getting more and more bedazzled by the second. To do this without even using a little bit of magic would be practically impossible. It was truly an outstanding feat another thing Laddie noticed was how Xavier had cunningly remained aloof from his own performance. It was a clever move on his own end to remove every suspicions of foul play. Laddie was the one who had brought up the bamboo pole using magic, so its credibility couldn't be questioned. It was also the same laddie who had had stuck it down the bucket using his own hands. Looking back now, the old man realized that Xavier hadn't even done a single thing. Adelia was the last piece of the puzzle. The old man tried to find an opening there, but that also proved to be a real bust. If Xavier had poured the water himself, the old man would have suspected that he had maybe tampered with the water by leaving traces of magic there. But it was Adelia who had been the instrument of the hour. He knew that the young girl well enough to know that she knew very little about magic. In fact, she possessed very little affinity for the craft. Also, the old man could vouch that the servant girl wouldn't do anything to compromise her position in the governor's household by aiding and abetting a stranger to defraud her employer. Laddie was bewildered. No matter how he tried to look at it, he couldn't point a finger at any loophole, especially since he himself had contributed to over 50% of the whole performance. 
so, unwillingly, he had been a willing participant in lending credence to the authenticity of Xavier's performance. When the story of what had happened here would be recounted in the future, people would say, the senior mage himself had provided the materials, so it has got to be legit. It dawned on Laddie that Xavier had used him, and in the most subtle way. It was a cold, calculated move. And because he had been clouded by his own doubts, he hadn't been able to see it coming. No doubt, the old man knew that this was all far from being a coincidence. In fact it was a well-scripted performance that had been executed deftly, leaving absolutely no room for doubt and no holes in the plot. Utterly outmaneuvered, the old man resigned to the fact that there was absolutely nothing he could disprove. He once again sighed inwardly, Xavier had proven to be a forward thinker. This entire thing had altered his scope of the world. At his advanced age, he didn't think this was even possible. This disturbed him greatly, and belittled his seemingly profound wisdom. Of the entire group, the quickest mind to regain its composure was that of the governors. This was due to so many reasons, but it was mainly because he was a politician. And even from the dawn of time, from the, the earliest civilizations, to the time of the Roman who initiated and perfected the parliament system, politics has always demanded a certain level of guile and emotional manipulation. So, for an experienced politician like the governor who was adept at masking his true emotions, hiding his true feelings was second nature to him. Despite the fact he was shocked to the same degree and on the same level as Laddie, he still somehow managed to keep his reactions in check. Of course, much like everyone else, he was astounded, but he didn't let it show too much. In fact, he was the only one who remained objectively sane about the performance. While the others were still swimming in the pool of shock and disbelief, the calm, but authoritative voice of the governor came, breaking the spell of silence. Xavier, is there anyone else who has the ability to destroy the bucket in this same manner? Xavier wasn't quick to answer. But eventually, he nodded in affirmation, further uplifting the governor's spirits. The governor, with his face frozen in a mask of serene calm, he coolly nodded back at Xavier, as if he would have been indifferent about it if she answer had been different from what he had been expecting. He lifted his head towards Adelia who for some odd reason, was very much still on top of Xavier's shoulders. Chapter 84 Cadence You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. The governor ignored the awkwardness of the whole scene and spoke with in a tranquil tone, Adelia, you will see to it that someone arranges a decent lodging for Xavier, he will be staying with us for a few days. Make sure it is suitable for a temporary arrangement. At least, till he is fixed up in a more permanent residence. Xavier took in the information as thought it was amusing just how presumptuous it was of the governor to make arrangements for his accommodation, without even consulting or bothering to ask if it was okay. Of course Xavier had no other plans whatsoever. But still, it would have been nice to ask. He felt like a piece of meat with the way the governor had overlooked him, even though he was standing right there. Adelia received the order and began her awkward descent down from Xavier's shoulders to the ground. It was a bit tricky for her because she wasn't the athletic type. Even when she touched down on the ground, her face was still red with shame. It didn't help that Xavier was the one who facilitated her descent by carrying her like a baby who weighed nothing more than three bowls of rice on a tray. Still blushing very hard, and unable to look Xavier squarely in the face, the beautiful, Blonde servant girl led Xavier out of that place with her cheeks bursting with the color red. The shrewd knight had also recovered from the shock of what he had witnessed and had already begun another round of shrewd analysis. Dale was aware of the process it usually takes for the approval of a guest to stay in governor's quarters. But he kept his doubts to himself. He knew that the governor, as lord of this region, had other arrangements. Dale tingled with excitement like a little boy who had chanced on a serious plot. The diabolic knight couldn't wait to see what the governor had in store for Xavier. It turned out that Dale's suspicions were well founded. His eyes followed the governor's every move, and just as he had suspected, something sinister occurred right there. Ednell.co The manipulative Quaid didn't utter a single word, but the high-handed look he gave Laddie was heavy with hidden meaning. 
Obviously, the old man caught on to what the governor had been trying to imply with his wordless message. Immediately, Caden bent down to salute. Dale recognized that salute. It was one he had seen one too many times. It was a salute reaffirming his loyalty. It was salute that said that he was never going spill what happened there that day. The governor had truly mastered his poker face. While the shifty governor retained a look of dead calm on the surface, beneath the cold composed mask he was wearing, Quaid was trembling with excitement. His hands were always hidden in his robes for a reason. It wasn't because he liked to appear in that way, it was because he hated having anyone see his fingers trembling in excitement like they were now. What Quaid had witnessed here today was the best and most interesting thing to have happened to him all year. The governor didn't rise to the position of power by missing out on life-changing opportunities. In fact, one of the traits that made him the governor was the chilling ability to see potential. He could see what no one else could see. And even if anyone else did manage to somehow see what he saw, they wouldn't be able to act on it. At least, not in the way he would. The one in the background, the only soul that hadn't uttered a single word all through the performance, watched with soft dark eyes as the whole scene unfolded. He was a character unlike the rest. His name was Cadence, and he was the son of the governor of the state capital. Cadence was a unique child. Unlike most children with powerful political figures as parents, Cadence didn't allow his background to rob him of the lessons and benefit of hard work. His life was one of sacrifice and studying. This was very uncommon at the time. Almost all the politicians' kids his age were playboys. They lived lives of luxury, which in turn opened the doors of dissipation, and flooded their lives with questionable vices. But Cadence, not allowing himself to be encumbered by the benefits of his privileged status, gave himself to studiousness. He practically devoured literary peace he could find. Magic just happened to be one of his many interests. In addition to his academic life, Cadence didn't neglect his moral life as well. His pursuit of excellence reflected in all areas of his life. He was a loyal son who abided by his father's teachings and statutes. To crown it all, he was also a very humble boy. Though he was very young, the governor's son had already developed a sound philosophy of life that was grounded in sound moral principles, as well as codes that had been indoctrinated into him by his father. From Cadence's perspective, he saw that the rules that make the world go round were questionable. His young mind saw that they were not fool.proof. Because he was close to the center of authority of a major metropolis, he saw first.hand that these universal rules appeared to be a bit deficient in the areas of politics and magic. He had been brooding on this for a while. He never bothered to voice his concerns and ambivalence to anyone, because he knew that there was no deep thinker around who would understand him. And even if there was such a mind, they would have been corrupted a long time ago by the scourge of life's unfairness. But today, Cadence had chanced on something of a life-changing experience. Indeed, it had been unexpected, but he didn't believe for a second that it was pure coincidence that he ran into this mysterious man whom Adelia and the rest referred to as Xavier. Xavier, Cadence repeated the name again in his head. Even the name sounds cool, and invokes mystery. In Cadence's mind, Xavier was much more than just a mysterious stranger. He was the clear manifestation and the answer to the nagging question that had been tugging at the creases of his mind. Yes, this was a man to whom the rules didn't apply to. This was a man who could break the rules. He was glad that he got to witness this. The fact that his father hadn't asked him to leave showed that the governor had complete faith in his son. Not just in the area of keeping secrets, but in his ability to judge for himself, without the influence of outsiders and external forces. When the small gathering began to disperse, Laddie walked over to his students with a stern expression on his face. All through the time that both Erlene and Cadence had known him, the old man always had a facial expression that gave off the aura of pure seriousness. They didn't think it was possible to see their tutor even more serious than he usually was. But Laddie surprised them by showing that there was an even higher degree of seriousness that they were yet to see. 
In a particularly deep croaky voice, Laddie charged his students saying, Listen up both of you. What you've seen here today has to be kept a secret. Is that clear? There was no reply. The old man added more flair to his speech and charged them again. Snap out of it. Servants were sent out for this. This is a very serious issue. You cannot tell anyone about this. The old man reiterated his warning again. Tell absolutely nobody. Though Erlene and Cadence were physically present, they might have as well been somewhere else at the same time. Unlike the governor, and Dale and Laddie, who were matured enough to get over something like this, both siblings were still trying to process what they had just seen. It was completely their fault. They had grown up in a world where magic was everything. They had had spent weeks, months, and the early formative years of their lives studying and practicing to become better mages, and ultimately, more powerful people. So, when Xavier successfully pulled the stunt of the century, he systematically destroyed the very foundation of all their belief system. He had done the impossible. And both Cadence and Erlene, young ones with very impressionable minds, were busying thinking what other possible wonders that awaited them in the real world. Though Erlene didn't realize it at the time, in her very volatile mind, deep in her subconscious, the seeds of rebellion had been sown. So, when the old man stood before them, speaking in a somber tone and with his face contorted in a tight grimace, in the mind's eye of the teenagers, they only saw a white-bearded figure standing with its mouth opening and closing, and gesticulating with its hands in an extremely funny way. Chapter 85 The Biggest Issue You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Not a word of his warning was being retained by the children of the governor. Though his voice was audible to the two siblings, they weren't listening at all. In fact, they were miles away from their bodies, busy daydreaming and replaying Xavier's miraculous performance in their heads. So, like a bunch of automatons, or a bunch of ventriloquist dolls, they both nodded absentmindedly in response to his warnings. It was the best way to get him off their backs and stop him from clobbering them with his ominous admonitions and apocalyptic warnings. Laddie was no fool, he saw and recognized the faraway looks in their eyes and knew that his words were actively falling on deaf ears. It wasn't their fault really. Even he himself already found himself getting endeared to the strange man. It had happened so suddenly. Like the proverbial dragon that had fought against gravity and stealthily made its way to the moon, Xavier had gradually made a place for himself in the old man's heart. Though, even if a knife were to be put at his throat, even at the point of death, the senior mage would never acknowledge this openly. But deep down, between him and heaven, the old man worshipped Xavier from the bottom of his heart. Unfortunately, he couldn't afford to allow his admiration for Xavier to stand in the way of him performing his duties. The kids had to be warned. So, Laddie tightened his already serious face and stepped forward menacingly towards the boy and the girl. I don't think you're listening to me. The white-bearded man didn't realize just how right he was about that statement. This is not a joke. What happened here today is now a state secret. So if any of you breathe a word of this to anyone, you will be prosecuted as traitors. Of course that last part was a bit over the top, but he had to exaggerate to get them both to comply. There was no way the children of the governor would be allowed to be prosecuted for something as insignificant as blabbering. But the two miners didn't know that. The old man's last threat woke them out of their slumber. Slowly, the light returned to their eyes. And as they gradually returned back to the present from the mental journey they had undertaken, a sullen look of worry clouded their face as they ruminated on the senior mage's last warning. Of course neither of them wanted to go to jail. At first, Erlene, the sibling who naturally tended towards rebellion, flirted with the idea of being prosecuted and thought of how cool it would make her seem. But very quickly, she realized it wouldn't be as glamorous as she thought it would be. Cadence didn't need to be told twice. The old man recognized the familiar effect of a threat that had been well received, and relaxed. He had driven his point home. Now off to your quarters both of you. They hurriedly shuffled on their feet as they made their way towards their rooms. 
and as they disappeared down the curve at the end of the hallway, the old man called out to them with his last instruction, and remember to study and practice today's lessons. Even as he yelled, Laddie knew that wasn't going to happen. There wasn't going to be any studying that night, not when their hearts had been hijacked by something so salacious and juicy. Of course none of them were going to study, they weren't going to catch much sleep either. And even if they did manage to fall asleep, their dreams would be replete with the reverberations and echoes of what they had witnessed here today. The old man sighed. It wasn't just the kids who wouldn't be getting any sleep that night. Even he wouldn't be spared the temptation of replaying Xavier's wonderful display of power. There was so much Laddie didn't understand, so much he was yet to comprehend. His mind was going to have a field day with this when he would lie in bed later that night. The only downside about this was, he was going to be robbed of a good night's rest. At his age, this was not something he could afford to joke with. Dot, well, this is going to be a long night. He thought to himself. True to the old man's word, that night proved to be a real battle for just about everyone, but in particular, Cadence. After dinner with the family, Cadence ascended the stairs that led to his room. A few moments later, tucked in bed and ready to retire for the night, Cadence closed his eyes and fought to call forth the sweet comfort of a good night's sleep. But unfortunately for him, it was proving to be a battle that he couldn't win. The minutes turned into hours, and the hours dragged out the relatively short period that was night. With each passing minute, it seemed like sleep was getting farther and farther away from him. Like a sick joke, midnight came and Caden still couldn't sleep. When he closed his eyes, his own haunting thoughts overwhelmed him. The memories of what he had watched the mysterious man accomplish played out again and again, each time, more vivid than before. The threat of the unknown was very real to him. He couldn't get it out of his head. When he opened his eyes to escape his own morbid imaginations, out from the darkness, at the bottom of his bed, the echoes of his own dour thoughts took on the form of shadows, and called out to him tauntingly. Unable to shut them out, Cadence rolled over to the other side of bed that faced the open window. He listened to the steady croaking the frogs playing in the open ponds, and he couldn't help but envy them in that moment. He pictured the amphibians basking under the pale moonlight, croaking without a care or worry in the world. Very faintly, in the direction of the open window, Cadence heard the spooky hooting of an owl. He turned to the other side of his feathered bed, hoping to find some kind of solace, but was met with an equally darker scene. When Cadence finally decided to confront the elephant in the room, what he feared the most about that night finally materialized. Cadence was well aware of the consequences of not having a good night's sleep. But at this point, his young mind didn't give him much of a choice. So, reluctantly, Cadence turned to face the nagging voice in his head, and all through the night, the young lad spent the entire period deep in thought, analyzing the Xavier situation with great vigor. Just as he feared, he ended up not sleeping that night. But by the end of the night, his sacrifice had proven to be worth it. He had been able to reach a conclusion. Cadence only needed the day to break, so he would be able to put it into action. By the first cockcrow, Cadence bolted upright in his bed. His eyes were bloodshot, like that of a madman's due to the fact that he hadn't slept a wink. But at that point, that really wasn't his major concern. He got up and washed his face in the washbowl located at the east wing of his room. He hurriedly went through the motions of changing out of his traditional night garments into something a more appropriate day wear. And with a spring in his step, the young Cadence opened his door and headed straight to his father's quarters that was located at the extreme end of the mansion. For a young impressionable lad, Cadence was pretty knowledgeable to his age. He knew that his father was usually the first person to rise up in the entire household. He rose up way earlier than the servants and way earlier than even the cock whose job was to announce the advent of the morning. As Cadence trudged through the hallways, he noted to himself how odd it was that his father was always the first to rise, and at the same time, always the last to go to bed. Cadence calculated that his father got roughly only two or three hours of sleep each night. This was amusing considering the fact that, as a governor and as a father, his workload was tremendous. 
In Cadence's mind, it was almost impossible to imagine how exactly this all worked out for his old man. But at that moment, this wasn't Cadence's biggest issue. Using the ever-lit fire torches to find his way, Cadence slowly made his way towards his father's home office where he knew he would be. Each step of the way, he rehearsed and rehearsed the way and manner with which he would present his request to his old man. This was a request that had been born from several hours of pondering. He had spent an entire night thinking on this, so he hoped with all his heart that he wouldn't be easily dismissed. Chapter 86 On My Way You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Cadence knew that if he was to be taken seriously, he had to present his request in the best possible light, so he decided to take on a more mature approach. Just like he had seen other grown-ups do with his father, Cadence decided to employ the tactic of stalling and baiting. Yes. He thought. That will surely do the trick. He willed himself to walk faster. So, in a matter of minutes, Cadence found himself standing before the giant doors of his father's study. By the time he had arrived there, the first streaks of dawn hadn't graced the skies yet. Cadence paused for a minute before knocking. Isn't it a little too early for this, the young lad wondered hesitantly. From the crack in the spaces between the metal hinges and where the doors hung, he could see the faint glimmer of candlelight, signifying that the governor was awake and already at his desk, probably attending to some administrative work. After lingering for a brief moment, Cadence decided to man up and go for it. He took a deep breath and lifted up his knuckles to knock on the door. Surprisingly, before his knuckles could make contact with the intimidating ancient dot-looking doors, Governor Quaid beat his son to it. From behind the seemingly impassable doors, the booming voice of the governor came, shattering the silence of the otherwise quiet mansion, rocking the serenity that had prevailed undisturbed for hours on end. Whoever you are, I know you are out there. You have five seconds to state your business. Cadence had been taken unawares completely. This wasn't how he had thought it would go down. But then again, his father had always been the perceptive type. So, having been caught, Cadence pushed the doors open and walked in gingerly. Huddled over his large office desk, the governor's eyes met those of his son's. Though his facial expression remained blank, the governor was surprised to see his son at such an hour. The sun wasn't even up yet. Quaid lifted up his head to get a proper look at the boy. Cadence. Is that you boy? Yes father. I hope I am not interrupting. Quaid shifted the pile of paperwork on his desk to the side and took off his pair of spectacles. Of course not son, come in. Cadence, who had still been hanging at the entrance all this while, closed them behind him and walked towards his father. Good morning father. Morning Cadence. How was your night? It was all right father. Using the light from the numerous candlesticks on the office, Quaid took a closer look at the boy to try and see if there was any visible sign of an ailment. He quickly dismissed the thought when he realized that the boy had actually walked a pretty good distance just to get here. No, whatever it was, it wasn't an ailment of the body. Quaid stole a quick glance at the window to see if time had crept by unnoticed. The dark sky outside reassured him that he had been right all along. Breakfast time was still a long way ahead. This was pretty strange, even though for Cadence. Quaid took a long hard look at his son and knew instantly that he hadn't slept much. In fact, it seemed to him that he hadn't slept at all. His puffy red eyes, as well as the wild expression on his face told Quaid everything about how the young man's night had gone. Quaid was his father, and consequently, he couldn't help but feel worried. But his instincts told him not smolder the boy with questions. So, Quaid didn't pressure his son to speak immediately. Cadence was a different breed, Quaid knew this more than anyone. Though he was young, he possessed a very high level of intelligence. Quaid had recognized this early and was proud of his son. So, he knew that if Cadence was here at this moment, truly there was something bothering him. So, Quaid waited for his son to open up to him. Cadence on the other hand took a seat and paused to gather his thoughts. 
His father always taught him that powerful men never spoke without purpose. And when they did speak, their words must be seasoned and tailored to suit the point. He reflected on his already rehearsed speech and how he had planned to go about this. However, as he sat before his father, Cadence decided to forsake all gimmicks, and instead, go straight to the point. So, after a brief and uncomfortable pause, Cadence opened his mouth to present his case to his father. Father, I have come to you at this hour with a humble request. It is my hope that you will at least consider it. As usual, Quaid's face remained as hard and as inscrutable as a rock. This was the norm for him actually, considering the fact that as governor, he had to listen to his constituents come to him all the time with different pleas and requests. Most times, it required a serious amount of attention and consideration. So, Quaid had mastered the art of maintaining a blank expression while he listened to others. Cadence was no different. Especially since he had chosen to approach him in the place of business. The young lad was already used to seeing his father as an unreadable ice sculpture. But that didn't deter him from his already set down path. He continued. I would be very glad if you could instate Mr. Xavier as my private tutor. Even as he said it, he was shaking with nervousness. He knew that what he had just asked for was a pretty big deal. As it was, Xavier himself was something of a local legend, and a big deal in his own regard. So, having such a powerhouse in his corner as a personal tutor would require a whole lot of maneuvering. The silence that followed was ridiculously loud. Quaid pondered on his son's request and couldn't help but feel proud. First off, Cadence had worked it out all on his own that Xavier was a real treasure. He also had the determination to pursue this dream of his by approaching his father at a time like this when he was supposed to be enjoying his pleasurable early morning sleep. Quaid was brimming with joyful pride on the inside. Though his facial expression didn't reflect his inner feelings because he was a hard politician who had no difficulty whatsoever keeping his emotions hidden. But deep down, Quaid was proud of his son. So, he took a minute to savor this pride before answering the young man in a tone that conveyed his profound respect for the boy's vision. Cadence, what you have asked for is good. It is a clear pointer to the fact that you have your sight set on big things, things that matter, Dot said Quaid diplomatically. But right now, Xavier is a guest in my home who also happens to be a hero that is about to be honored. Quaid paused to see if any tinge of disappointment had crept into his son's eyes. He was pleased to see that there was t even the slightest trace of disappointment. The young man's eyes retained their fire and hope. Pleased with what he saw, Quaid continued, So, right now, I can't read much in the way of interfering with his choices. Quaid slurred the last two words in such a way that it would be practically impossible for Cadence not to notice the implied message by reason of his heavy emphasis on that last part. Quaid's hopes weren't dashed. Even though Cadence was merely an adolescent, as a son of the governor who had been educated in the fundamentals of statesmanship and politics, he had been gifted with the ability to pick up on the subtleties of implied and hidden meanings in conversations. This was one of those times. Cadence's sharp mind immediately picked up on the discrepancy between the governor's initial and final tone. In his head, he juxtaposed them and almost immediately, the hidden meaning came to light. Quaid didn't think it was possible for his son's face to glow any brighter cadence proved him wrong. A fresh surge of hope flooded his being as he deciphered his father's hidden message. The key word there was, choices. Basically, what Quaid was actively trying to tell his son was that, he as a governor couldn't force Xavier to do his own will. But if at any point in time, for some reason, Xavier decided of his own volition to stay on as Cadence's teacher, then it was mission accomplished. Cadence's task now was to somehow make sure that Xavier stays on as his own tutor. However he chose to do it wasn't his concern. In that very moment, Cadence appreciated his father's wisdom and foresight more than ever. He stood up briskly from the chair he was seated in opposite his father, and bowed down respectful. Thank you father. I will be on my way now. Chapter 87 Breakfast You are listening at NovelFull.audio
Quaid watched with a smile of amusement as his son dashed out in blind haste. Sometimes, even he couldn't believe just how intelligent his own son was. And he was still so young. Quaid chuckled to himself as he bent down to work once again. The bottomless pit of the seemingly unending administrative duties swallowed Quaid again, and soon he forgot about the carefree nature of youth. Cadence was on a mission and no one could stop him now. He casually breezed into the servants' quarters looking for any bit of information regarding the stranger's location. After about two whole hours of interrogating multiple servants, Cadence was still deficient of the one piece of prime information that was needed for the next phase of his plan. However, he soon struck gold with one of maids. The short scrawny girl with rather large eyes told him what he needed to hear. I heard some chatter about a fancy lodging being put together for some big shot who recently came into town as your father's guest master Cadence. So you know exactly where I can find him. She nodded vehemently. One hand on her broom, she stuck out her hand in the direction she was speaking about. Over their master Cadence. In a section of the mansion called the Imperial Suite. I believe the guest is Locat. Cadence bolted in that direction on his quick sturdy legs before the maid could even finish. The Imperial Suite. Cadence thought excitedly. Of course he would be there. Why didn't I think of that sooner? Cadence already knew the answer. The imperial suite was a wing of the estate that was reserved exclusively for close and important guests of the state who were important enough to be lodged in the governor's own home. Cadence quickened his pace and raced towards the residence of the mysterious stranger. He hadn't even had breakfast yet, and yet, he was still bursting to energy. Within a few minutes, Cadence skidded to a halt right in front of Xavier's temporary residence. He couldn't believe that he was finally about to meet the man whom had taught him so much without even needing to open his mouth. His plan was finally taking shape, when only just a short while ago, it had been nothing but an idea in his head. Once again Cadence lifted up his hand to knock, and once again, he couldn't bring himself to complete his action. Come on Cadence, you have to be more creative, he thought to himself. This is the Mr. Xavier, the legendary orc exterminator, the one who is above magic. I need to be more creative else, I wouldn't be taken seriously. So, that was how Cadence decided to take a different route this time. He took a deep breath, looked squarely at the door as if it was his adversary, and yelled at the top of his voice, Mr. Xavier. Good morning. It's time for breakfast. He repeated the same cycle some three, four times until he was sure that Xavier had heard him. Cadence didn't know it, but turned out that it had been pointless to call Xavier's name more than once. On the other side of the door, inside the well-furnished room, Xavier's eyes flung open at the sound of his name being yelled. He wasn't sure if he had heard right, but it sounded like a kid had just called his name. He waited again for confirmation, and sure enough, his name was being called, and also something about breakfast as well. He quickly got up and slipped into decent clothing. Then he headed to the door to check on the owner of the voice. Xavier swung the door open to see the starry-eyed, five-foot, man-child gazing back at him anxiously. Xavier instantly recognized his visitor as the quiet young boy from yesterday. Xavier frowned slightly and wondered. Isn't this the governor's son? Why is he the one who has been tasked with a menial job of calling me out for breakfast? Don't they have servants for this type of stuff? Xavier regarded the young boy for some time, and realized that throughout the period he had been with the small group yesterday, he hadn't uttered a single word that the boy was quiet and reserved, could only mean one of two things, either he was extremely smart or he was the exact opposite of smart. But whatever the case was in regards to the boy's situation, Xavier agreed that it definitely wasn't the governor's son's duty to call a guest for breakfast. The whole thing was weird on two fronts. The second weird aspect was the fact that nobles were mostly xenophobic. They generally looked down on the lower class of their own constituents. So, it was a bit odd that a noble would consider inviting an outsider to have breakfast with him. Xavier was fully aware of the significance of an invite of this proportion. 
It was almost as if his celebrity status was finally bridging the gap between the social strata. He couldn't help but feel honored by the invitation. Xavier's ego stirred like a mountain lion that had been roused from its slumber. He felt like he was being taken seriously. Hold on a bit young man, I will be out in a minute. Surprised that Xavier had been so quick to honor his invitation, Cadence found himself saying, of course Mr. Xavier. Cadence was thrilled. He didn't think it would be this easy to get such an important figure to have breakfast with him. He was genuinely pleased with Xavier's humility. As a boy who had come up amongst the social elite of the country, he had seen and gotten used to the pompousness of the elite. Cadence was very close to worshipping Xavier. So, for a man like Xavier to honor a young boy's invitation like him, well, it only set Xavier on a much higher pedestal. Dot Xavier came out a short while later all brushed up. Cadence led the way. With absolutely nothing to speak about, they trudged on in silence as they made their way to the dining area. Some moments later, as both Xavier and Cadence entered the dining room, Xavier noticed that two entities had already taken their place at the dining. Quaid, the regal governor was seated at the head of the long dining table that was bedecked in white tablecloth. Seated right next to her father was the volatile Erlene, and standing next to both father and daughter was the familiar and trustworthy face of Adelia. As Xavier made his way towards the dining table from the entrance, he couldn't help but notice the looks of surprise on both of the girls. It was almost as if they didn't think he would be there at the time. This was particularly awkward, and Xavier began to wonder if in fact it was possible that he might have misread the situation. Eventually he peeled his gaze from both girls and decided to check out the facial expression of his host. Xavier hadn't had the privilege of knowing the governor personally. But judging from his experience with him the previous day, Xavier was convinced that he would have better luck trying to read a statue's facial expression than trying to guess what the governor was thinking. Xavier recalled the governor's face being as inscrutable as a sculpture. Discerning Quaid's mood and thoughts was more difficult than trying to use a hook to pull out a swordfish by its snout. Truthfully, it wasn't that his face was permanently locked in a scowl, it wasn't the fact that he had one of those ice-cold penetrating stares. No, it was way worse than that. It was the blandness of his expression. It was the fact that it was literally impossible for anyone to know what he was thinking at any given point. It was the emotionless, generic blank stare that irked Xavier. So, when he turned in the direction of the governor, hoping to catch even the slightest whiff of what this was about, Xavier was taken aback by the sight that greeted him. Instead of the usual poker face that was typical of the governor, on his face was something that resembled something like a smile. By all count, Quaid looked particularly happy with his arrival. At least, that was how it appeared to Xavier. As Xavier and Cadence approached the table, Quaid stretched out his hand towards the left-hand side of the table, welcoming Xavier and ushering him to his place. As was the custom, Cadence sat next to his father on his left-hand side, and Xavier carefully took his seat beside Cadence. Mr. Xavier, glad you could join us. I hope the lodgings were to your liking. Yes, Governor. Xavier remembered that Adelia had been tasked by the governor to procure a decent accommodation for him. So, he decided to give a more positive feedback instead of his regular two, three words reply. Chapter 88 Joining Us You are listening at NovelFull.audio My quarters are indeed very comfortable. I felt right at home. That's great, the governor boomed. While the governor was still speaking, Adelia brought in the meal of the hour. She looked very professional and smart in her maid uniform. Holding up the first tray, she dropped it very carefully on the table. As she removed the lid, the fresh aroma of dairy-based breakfast filled the whole space. Given the fact that this was a governor's abode, it was a relatively simple breakfast, Xavier half expected a mini feast of turkeys, whole roasted pigs, jesters, music, basically anything that spelled opulence. But instead, Xavier was met with a moderately decent breakfast of homemade bread, well-processed cheese, some carrots, cabbage, peas and green vegetables. 
Xavier was impressed. This wasn't what he had been expecting at all, not by a long shot. The meal looked very simple, but it was high quality. The vegetables stood out the most. It was evident that they had been nurtured in a very fertile environment. The bread and looked divine. Xavier found himself getting eager to dive right in. As was their custom, the small family didn't start eating until the governor had taken the first bite. Then, as if on cue, Erlene reached out with the serving spoon to dish out her own portion of the simple but rich breakfast, Cadence followed suit, and then Xavier. As they all began to eat in silence, Xavier noticed how they all ate heartily, especially the kids. Since they were all privileged children and products of the top brass, a part of Xavier thought that their attitude to food would be indifferent. But it turned out that his suppositions were wrong. Xavier learned an important lesson that day, he learned that no matter the class, food was food for just about everyone. They all ate with the vigor of bears. Except Erlene who toyed with her vegetables, but after receiving a stern look from her father, she braced up and forced the carrots and peas down her throat. While the family and their guest began to eat, an embarrassing sound hit the ears of everyone. Xavier froze. Then it came again, this time more aggressive and more pronounced than before. G.R.H.H.H. Xavier recognized that sound immediately. It was a sound he was all too familiar with. During his days as a member of the special forces, on some missions that required going for days on end without having anything in the stomach, it was that sound that kept him company all through those long, bitter, cold nights. It was the sound of a hungry stomach. The second time the aggressive sound from the growling stomach came, Xavier's sharp perceptive ears picked it up very quickly and immediately got to working on tracing its roots. Because of the small number of suspects in the room, Xavier didn't have to look very far. It turned out the culprit was none other than the beautiful blue-eyed maid that was Adelia. Xavier was a bit puzzled at first. He didn't understand how Adelia could be hungry when she herself had been involved in the preparation process of the meal. The whole thing was comical to Xavier, almost ironic. It was like a man allowing himself to thirst even when he was right at the bank of a stream of water. Thinking the others found it hilarious as well, Xavier made the innocent mistake of cracking a joke about it, Adelia. It sounds like you have an entire monster growling in your stomach. The joke started out well. It was exactly the kind of thing that a bunch of elites would do at the table. Look down and make mockery of the servant or lower class. But it wasn't the beginning of the joke that was the awkward part, it was what Xavier said next that made it seem like he had just committed an unforgivable sin. Or do you want to have my breakfast to feed your monster? Xavier only caught on to the severity of his mistake when the general atmosphere of the room changed. Opposite him, Berlene stopped with her fork halfway to her mouth and gazed at Xavier in shock. She looked at him as if she couldn't believe he had opened his mouth to suggest something of that nature. With the way she was acting, one would have thought that Xavier had invited a goat to the table instead of another human being. Standing behind her was Adelia whose face also froze up in shock when Xavier suggested that she eat with them. Xavier noticed how she immediately looked at the governor in fear and with pleading eyes. Then shamefully, she lowered her gaze, and kept her head down, staring at the ground, afraid to speak a single word. Erlene and Cadence silently exchanged looks, not knowing what to say as well. This had never happened before. Dot Xavier was a bit shocked that such a harmless joke could cause such a powerful reverberation in the room. He still didn't know what he had done wrong. He wondered if maybe it was against the household's rule to make jokes at breakfast. Or was it the fact that he wasn't to speak at all? He groaned mildly in exasperation. It was like walking on eggshells around this people. There was no way of knowing exactly what to do and shouldn't do. So, Xavier turned to face the man of the house in a bid to at least find out what exactly he had done wrong. The moment he set his eyes on the governor, Xavier found that he was also looking at himself. Then, like a sudden bolt of lightning, the truth hit Xavier like a jolt of electric shock. It was a truth that he had come to witness firsthand. 
It was a truth that Xavier should have realized. Of course, the rules of this ice sky were much different. Though they appeared to have advanced as a civilization, they still retained the primitive habit of class segregation. Therein lay the foundation of the problem of the moment. When Xavier had suggested that an ordinary maid dine with them at the same table, in the minds of everyone, he had just suggested something blasphemous. Servants had their place. And nobles had their own place. These two classes, much like parallel lines traveling opposite each other, could never meet. No matter how friendly or casual their relationship was. The ugly truth was that despite being close friends and an important part of the family, Adelia was still and would always just be the maid. Her place was with the servants. Hence, she could never deign to sup at the same table as the members of the upper class, which in this case was the governor and his family. The full weight of his seemingly innocent joke dawned on him now. Xavier began to feel really uncomfortable. This was in sharp contrast with his own personal creed. Xavier wondered whether his failure to have picked up on this was as a result of his recent rise to stardom in the eyes of everyone here. As a person with values, his eyes had never been closed to oppression. That just wasn't who he was. He glanced again at the poor girl and saw the shame of hunger written all over her. Even though she was obviously in need of sustenance, she still couldn't eat. Simply because it wasn't her place to dine with the elites. This was truly a sad reality. Xavier was now fully aware of the fact that in the sight of his hosts, he might have as well as slapped them in their face and spit on the opportunity they had given him to dine with them. Clearly, they thought he had just offended the established protocol of their time. Just as Xavier fought to find a way out the mess he had put himself in, Governor Quaid stepped in with a charming smile and a follow-up statement that diffused the whole tension, and at the same time, somehow added to it. Adelia. He called out to the maid in a suave tone. Upon hearing her name, Adelia cringed and recoiled inwardly at the thought of the fate that awaited her. She had already given up, and was prepared for the consequences of her growling tummy. But, the poor maid was completely unaware of just what the fates had in store for her. Would you mind joining us for breakfast, he asked politely. You can sit next to Xavier if you want. Quaid's words at this point could have very well been a nuclear bomb. Across the table, cutlery dropped from the hands of the children in shock, and forks hit the plates with a clanging sound. Cadence and Erlene stared at their father, mouth open wide in disbelief. Utterly shocked by his words. But no one was more shocked than Adelia. She was smitten to the bone by his words. Chapter 89 What's the matter you are listening at novel full dot audio. Yet again, the fates had displayed their ubiquitous hands in the ordering of the events in the human realm. A servant, dining with her master, not just any master but the governor himself, a man whom was practically the most powerful entity in the entire city, this was indeed a life-altering event. On this continent, in this social world, and in this time, such a thing was unheard of. Even history didn't bother to tone down the truth when it came to the social classes and the practice of segregation in medieval Europe. There wasn't a single aristocrat, government official, or virtually anyone in power who would be kind enough to give a servant a seat at their table. A thought of this nature could never take form in the hearts of any of them. It was literally inconceivable. Class was everything, even those who were rich were extremely selective of the caliber of elite people who were allowed to dine at their table. For someone like Governor Quaid who represented the entire category of the top brass, the number of families who could be afforded the privilege of having breakfast with him, and his family, could be counted on the fingers of one hand. This was the history, and the primary reason behind the shocked countenances of the siblings. Adelia in particular, was dumbfounded. Her vision went white, as blood was diverted from every other part of her body, and headed straight to her head with lightning speed. The jar of water which she held tightly in her hand was threatening to break to pieces under the overbearing power of her crushing grip. One day ago, even one hour ago, if Adelia had been told that she would be seated at the same table with the governor, his family, and with his esteemed guest, she wouldn't have taken it seriously. 
In fact, she would have waved it off as the ramblings of a deranged mind. Such things happened only in a fantasies and fairy tales. Due to the blue-eyed blonde's tight grip on her own reality, even in her own dreams, she wasn't averse to admitting that the odds of this happening was virtually zero. The entirety of her existence had been subjected to the harsh reality of her situation. She had accepted it with the whole of her heart and with the whole of her being. So, to the poor girl, much like the millions of others living on the opposite side of affluence and power, the dream of dining with a noble was on par with the dream of riding on the back of a dragon into war. They both could never happen. Eventually, when she dared to lift up her eyes to glance in the direction of the governor, she was met with an approving look and a nod, encouraging her to go ahead. Adelia's knees almost gave away underneath her. Finally, she forced herself to come to terms with her new reality and willed her legs to move forward before her reluctance would be misconstrued as rudeness. Adelia was positioned right behind Erlene, who was seated right opposite Xavier. So, the poor girl who could barely stand at the moment was forced to circumvent the remaining length of the table, to enable her get to the place she had been allotted. Which was beside Xavier. Adelia sighed inwardly, though her journey was supposed to be a relatively short one, to the young maid, it seemed like a trip halfway around the world. With every single pair of eyes watching her every move, Adelia made her way around the table with steady strides and purposeful steps. Until finally, she pulled out the chair beside Xavier and sat down with a graceful thud. Of course, this clever positioning was no coincidence. The diabolical mind of the governor had picked up on a subtle vibe between the two of them. So, he had cleverly engineered the situation that brought them together at the table at this time. Anything to keep Xavier happy of course. And he had done it in such a way whereby it felt like he was actually doing the girl a favor. This level of manipulation could only be achieved after several decades of playing the game. Quaid chuckled congratulatory thoughts to himself as he watched the young maid try desperately to conceal her joyful grin. Quaid watched with amusement as Xavier's own face remained professional. The young man betrayed no hint of satisfaction or joy. Quaid neither said nor showed anything, but deep down, he was more than impressed by the young man's composure. The egocentric governor liked to think that he saw a bit of himself in Xavier. Clearly, the young man had his emotions, thoughts and will under control. Quaid thought this was commendable, for in his own mind, those three parts of a man's consciousness were the organs that controlled every aspect of a man's life. So, as he sipped his water and watched Xavier closely, he became more and more convinced that his original assessment of the young man was spot on. Aside from Xavier's fearsome reputation that suggested that he was a cold-blooded killer, he was obviously a rational mind too. This deadly combination is rare in young men. Xavier my boy, I definitely struck gold with you. You will be the arm that will mold Cadence into the perfect weapon. The governor thought to himself as he munched on a piece of bread with a thin slice of cheese. Quaid commended his son for taking the initiative. The fact that Xavier was here with him was proof of the fact that his sons had already begun his own beguiling. Quaid couldn't help but giggle slightly. Like father, like son. Though Cadence was still too young to realize it, the fact was that he was very much indeed his father's son. But of course, Quaid's plan was way beyond keeping Xavier's around solely because of his son's need for an astute tutor. He had a much grander scheme in mind. Completely oblivious of the storm clouds hovering in the diabolical mind of the poker-faced governor, Adelia dove right into the rich breakfast, and ate to her fill while maintaining an outer semblance of calm and proper table etiquette. The entire family and their guests passed the rest of their time at the table in silence. Breakfast was devoured by all parties and soon, everyone disbanded. The governor was the first to recuse himself. Xavier noticed him checking his pocket watch every now and then, and therefore concluded that the governor was a principled man who worked with time. It could have also been the fact that had other appointments lined up for the day. 
So, when everyone dispersed, Xavier followed suit and rose up from the table to head back to his quarters, from where he would await further directives from his host regarding the next item on his itinerary. Xavier. Behind him, Adelia's sing.song voice came. Not sure what this was about, he turned around to look at her. Yeah. I'd like to see you for a minute, do you mind, sure thing. What's the matter? Adelia shook her head, not here silly. I meant somewhere else obviously. It's all good. Where? Adelia didn't reply him. Instead, she swung her head behind her, and checked from side to side to see if anyone else was close by. When she confirmed that they were alone, Adelia marched towards the exit. Let's go. Still not completely sure what this was about, Xavier followed her as she led him to an unknown location. Adelia took a route that was completely different from the one that he and Cadence had initially used when coming here. Xavier marveled at just how large the estate was. Just when he thought there couldn't possibly be more twists and turns, Xavier found himself being led down an even more complex series of corners. Finally, they emerged at a secluded area that was cut off from most members of staff and household. It was a garden of sorts, it was well tended to in the sense that there were still neat passages between the vegetation. But the flowering trees were so high up that no one could see anything behind the curve that disappeared in obscurity. When they finally arrived here, Xavier got the feeling that Adelia probably wanted to talk about something private. So, he was instantly on alert for any kind of bad news whatsoever. Adelia noticed he had gotten a little bit more tense. Relax Xavier, I am not going to bite. She said as she leaned against the wall with arms crossed on her chest. Xavier raised his eyebrows asked her warily, Is there something wrong Adelia? Are you in danger? Adelia's wild blue eyes danced with amusement in her sockets. Wow, are you even capable of not overanalyzing everything? Not every situation is a battle Xavier, I'm sure you know this already. Chapter 90 Exclusive Office You are listening at NovelFull.audio Xavier took a step back, thinking maybe she was right. Are you sure? Because this cloak and dagger thing seems a bit over the top. She didn't answer him immediately. Instead, she reclined on the wall fully, and with a faraway look in her eye, she began to narrate in a chirpy tone, When I first came into the governor's service, I was just a child. I used to run around with the older maids, making beds, running errands and occasionally, scrubbing in the kitchen. Xavier kept mute, and looked at her interestingly as she took him on a walk through her memories. At first it was difficult you know. Not the tasks, but the crushing loneliness. There was no one I could talk to amongst the servants. They were mostly hung up on their own personal affairs. She fondly touched the stem of tree she was leaning on. So, I would wander off on my own during my free time, hoping to find someplace where I could be by myself and cry my eyes out. That was when I stumbled upon this place. She paused for a minute to gather her thoughts, and continued. Once I found this spot, I would come here alone at every given chance to enjoy the overbearing sadness of solitude. But something soon changed. She pointed over to a clearing right around the curve. One day, I was on my way here, and I heard some voices around the corner. I quickly hid myself and watched the drama. I saw the thirteen-year-old Erlene, with bloody knuckles on top of a boy, punching and beating him. Xavier's eyes flared up in disbelief and in judgment when Adelia disclosed this fact. Noticing his reaction, Adelia quickly moved to clear the air. No, no, you misunderstand. She wasn't just beating the boy for no reason, he was the bully that had been picking on her younger brother, Cadence. You see, I also didn't know at the time, and much like you, I also jumped to conclusions. Erlene soon spotted me while I was hiding, and before she could confront me, I took off and ran as quickly as my little legs could carry me. She giggled as she remembered the sight. Oh, I didn't stop running until I had reached my room. It turned out that Cadence's bully was actually the son of a diplomat. 
so, he wasn't happy at all when his son came back looking like he had been stomped by a horse. Xavier listened with rapt attention. That night, the governor assembled all the servants to inquire about what happened, the boy had been so terrified of Erlene that he didn't mention her name, instead he told his father that he had been jumped by a thief. The governor questioned each and every one of us if we saw anything, but no one saw anything. I saw Erlene staring at me with pleading eyes, silently beseeching me to not speak a word of it. So, I kept her secret and kept mum. She stopped for a moment to catch her breath. That night, Erlene found me and thanked me. A week later, she requested from her father that I be assigned to her. And since then, we have grown pretty close. Xavier was touched by the heartfelt recollection, but he still didn't understand how this concerned him in any way. Almost as if Adelia had read his mind on the subject, her follow-up statement addressed his concern. Listen Xavier, I grateful for your concern, and for also sticking up for me, but I have made a place for myself here. I and Erlene and this family have an incredible relationship, it might not be ideal, but it's genuine, and I am satisfied with that. She paused to make sure her words sank in. So, I humbly suggest that you refrain from making such jokes in the future. I don't how things are where you are from, but here, there is a class factor that puts a glaring gap between nobles and maids. She adjusted her posture and faced Xavier squarely, hoping he would grasp the seriousness of her next statement. I am not sure if you've realized it yet, but the governor was pretty lenient in the way he handled your ambush. Xavier recoiled at the way she made use of the word ambush. That wasn't how he had seen it at all. Seriously Xavier, you should be thankful. The whole thing could have gone south really quickly. Other nobles of far lesser pedigree would have handled it very differently, trust me. Xavier said nothing. He had nothing to say really. Adelia's exposition only served as a reminder of the fact that he was indeed in a strange land. In that moment, more than ever, he could feel the yawning chasm between him and this era. Like oil and water, like a bird that had been yanked out of the skies and placed in the deep sea, Xavier felt so out of place. As impossible as it was for Xavier to accept it, the glaring truth was that the people in this ice sky still had the mindset of the feudal period. Socially relevant issues such as gender equality and class segregation were still very much a thing. It was like reliving the Dark Ages all over again. The concept of freedom, equality, and democracy was completely lost on the people of this time. Because he could not force his radical, fire.brand, trans.generational reforms on anyone, Xavier had only four words to reply Adelia's sermon.like speech, I don't think so. With those words being his final say on this topic, Xavier turned his back on Adelia and walked right out of the clearing and into a hallway that would take him back to a familiar path. Behind him, standing in the corner, Adelia was left behind with her own thoughts, silent in meditation, and alone. Just as she had been in that same place several years ago. Back in his private and exclusive office, the governor of Princey State sat in his swivel chair like the political figure that he was. The governor had been up to his neck with state affairs before this whole Xavier incident. It wasn't abnormal for him to be drowning in administrative duties. This was part of the perks of being a governor of an important state. But as soon as he discovered Xavier, all of a sudden, it felt like a flood of light flooded the dark tunnel that was his daily routine. This beam of light melted the darkness away, leaving him with a clear line of sight of a new batch of objectives that hung in the horizon, just a little bit out of his reach, and at the same time, so close that he could almost touch them. In that moment, as Quaid sat on his chair in his office, he eagerly unfolded a distinct scroll. The scroll which was in the governor's hand at the moment was no ordinary scroll. This was a unique brand. It was unique because an ordinary person could chance on a scroll like this, and still wouldn't be able to gain access to the message within. This scroll in particular, that happened to be in Quaid's hands at the moment, was an advanced scroll that was used for a different type of communication. What set this scroll aside from the other basic types was just how exclusive its reader's list was. 
only humans who were of higher or equal rank of a marquee could make use of it. As a communication scroll, its purpose was to transmit extremely sensitive information of high authority. So, this was one of the reasons why the distinct-looking scroll was being handled carefully by Quaid. Asides from the fact that Quaid was a governor and a ruling principality of Princey State, the shrewd man was also one of the major dukes of the Marsher Empire. As it was, Princey State was his sub-dot-dominion that was exclusive to his rule. The name Princey was more than just the name of the state, Princey was also the surname of the governor's family. He had descended from one of the most powerful of the founding families, whose surname also corresponded with the name of the state. As Governor Quaid unfurled the elegant, mysterious dot looking scroll, he drank in its contents eagerly like a thirsty dog lapping up water viciously at a watering hole. But the governor wasn't just twitchy because of an ordinary communication scroll, he had had enough of them in the past. It was much more than that. The information contained therein was aligned with his diabolic suspicions, and at this hour, Xavier was at the center of them all. If the governor knew how to express joy, he probably would have been bursting into joyous laughter already. The information in the scroll was clear enough, and the beauty about it was that it matched his suspicions almost word for word. Name Xavier Mace